Hi, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. I'm coming to you via the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com, you know, almost every week, with tidbits and morsels from Chinese history. We're back again with another half hour or so overview. I think I may have mentioned this at one time or another. I've noticed, both in the course of my daily life and in interacting with my Chinese friends, that even a decade into the 21st century, the enmity still felt by many Chinese against the nation of Japan still seems to be burning hot. This isn't true in all cases, of course, and I won't even venture a wild estimate about how widespread these anti-Japanese feelings really are, but I know they're there in China. If you like to peruse the Chinese web, or perhaps go one or two layers deeper than what's ordinarily provided to you by the corporate press, for lack of a better word, I don't like to call it that, with all the negative connotations that go with that term, but if you scratch a little deeper into what's being written in the Chinese press, posted in a million Weibo's and websites in Chinese society, you know, on bulletin boards and as comments to various postings about current events, once in a while you'll see some rather heated comments regarding Japan. And it's like, man, where did that come from? This is especially true when there's some minor flare-up or something and Chinese netizens or Wangmin sound off on Japan. There was a piece in the uh, People's Daily the other day from uh, the August 26th edition. Uh, Zhao Qi Zheng, a member of the CPCCC and CPPCC, in other words, he's important, he wrote this piece called China-Japan Relations Must Be Viewed Through a Long Lens. The China Daily and a Japanese nonprofit called Genron, they cooperated to do this survey recently, and they found 29% of Chinese surveyed had a favorable opinion of Japan, and 70% thought negatively. Mr. Zhao has said there have been 2,000 years of friendship and 50 years of confrontation. The long-standing friendship can be attributed to a deep-rooted tradition of cultural exchanges, and the 50 years of confrontation was due to the Japanese invasion of China. So today's episode, well, this is sort of an idea one of my listeners in Hefei gave me. I thought we'd sort of explore some of the historical causes that have been so dramatic and traumatic that down to this day, people in China and the Chinese-speaking world still have very strong anti-Japanese feelings. So in today's episode of the China History Podcast, I thought we'd look at the years, which in this amateur podcaster's worthless opinion, are the major cause for the cloud that always seems to follow China-Japan relations. From a historical perspective, the whole dynamic of the China-Japan relationship is a, is a fascinating one. Here you have... Two great nations, two great cultures, their achievements in art, architecture, their literature, philosophy, and the, you know, the intricate and unique things they both did with their respective languages, which are not similar at all and not even from the same linguistic branch. It's truly amazing. These were two independent giants of world civilization who both gave the people they interacted with some of the greatest in cultural and technological gifts. And these gifts were brought back to their respective civilizations and all these ideas and eye-opening things. Who knows how much they shaped the world as they spread from the Far East to the Middle East and into Europe. Let's take a quick look. I mean, a real quick look. We're jumping over the Three Gorges Dam and the Grand Canyon combined with this overview of Sino-Japanese history. But in order to get to where our little episode begins, we need to get some perspective. Where did it all begin? Well, 57 AD, that's the quick answer. That's how far back these friendly rivals go. 57 AD, that's the year during the reign of the Eastern Han Emperor Guangwu. Remember the Guangwu Emperor, founder of the Eastern Han? He was credited with the victory over Wang Mang and his ill-fated Xin Dynasty. The Xin, you recall, separates the Han Dynasty into western and eastern parts, and it's the Guangwu Emperor who overthrew Wang Mang at Kunyang in 23 AD uh, in Rome. This is, give you a little 
historical perspective, this is the time of Tiberius. And during the Guangwu Emperor's reign in the year 57 AD, we have the first historical evidence that the two nations knew each other because there was written evidence that in 57 AD, a delegation from Kyushu was in Luoyang at the time. Legends abound, but there's no hard evidence that much earlier during the time of the uh, first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, 221 BC, there were a series of expeditions to Japan where the Qin emperor was sending some of his more adventurous hangers-on to Japan to get the skinny about some elixirs of life that somebody had told him about. There's some smoke about this expedition, but as far as all my history books are concerned, this is a definite maybe. And just as a side note, right about the same time that Japan and China meet each other, that's the moment when Buddhism comes to China. So Japan and China, for all intents and purposes, these two cultures go way back, 19 and a half centuries at least, if not more. Not to dwell on anything, but for the next half a millennia, the two countries slowly got to know each other. A conduit was being set up that allowed Japanese to get acquainted with Chinese culture. Things really start to hot up between Japan and China in the Sui and Tang dynasties. That's the period where, between 607 and 894, a whole bunch of official delegations between the two great cultures were carried out. And we know from past China history podcasts, this was such a golden age for China that even today, to this day, what Chinese doesn't look back with pride for what came out of this time period? And Japan was like a sponge. When you hear people talk about how much Japan borrowed from China and how much flowed from this direction to that direction, it was this period during the Sui and especially the Tang. This is where the floodgates opened and visiting Japanese delegations, they feasted well at the table of Chinese culture and wisdom. Now, if you look at a map of the Far East, you'll see this appendage-shaped countries hanging in between China and Japan, and this, of course, is Korea. And because of the way the tectonic plates shifted and the way the earth formed, Korea, with its strategic geographic position, was often an ongoing battleground between China and Japan. We'll see all the way up to modern times, it's often in Korea where China and Japan slug it out, usually with their proxies, you know, opposing factions at the top layers of the Korean power structure. Korea served as sort of a buffer zone in a way. And both China and Japan would get a little excited and irritated any time the other encroached on Korea's geographic territory. In 633 AD, we have the Battle of Baekgang, where the two great Korean kingdoms of Baekje and Silla face off against each other. In this case, Baekje was backed by Japan, and the kingdom of Silla was backed by the Tang Dynasty, and their emperor Gao Zong, remember him, son of Tai Zong, Wu Zetian, was his empress. It was during his reign that this epic battle took place, and the Tang interests prevailed over the Japanese interests in Korea. Nonetheless, Sino-Japanese relations survived this uh, disturbance, and then in 1274, and again in 1281, after a bit of a diplomatic dust-up between Kublai Khan and the Japanese sovereign, we saw the Mongol invasions of Japan, which both failed due to the kamikaze, or divine winds. But despite all these military ventures or misadventures, Buddhism was the great common bond that kept things with Japan on an even keel. Zen Buddhism, called Chan in Mandarin, was a religion where you saw a great deal of good things happen. In fact, from about the Southern Song Dynasty, which you no doubt recall from podcast CHP29, ran from 1132 to 1279, China and Japan during that period got real close together and raised their awareness and appreciation of the gifts each provided to the other. Zen Buddhism as you know, really took off in Japan. And it was from China that this branch of Buddhism came from. And as Zen 
grew in Japan, there was a keen appreciation of the land from which this branch of Buddhism was born. During the Ming Dynasty, which ran concurrently with the time of the Ashikaga Shogunate, we see the Buddhism-loving shogun of Japan, Yoshimitsu, acknowledging Japanese suzerainty. This didn't go over well, and after he passes from the scene, his son, Yoshimochi, takes over, and that's it for the good times. This shogun didn't care for Buddhism, and he cared even less about maintaining friendly relations with China. So Japan and China, they weathered all these minor ups and downs. So this nice little relationship between the Chinese Ming court and the Ashikaga shogunate eh, it didn't last terribly long. In addition to cultural exchanges that centered on Buddhism, the shogun had also worked out a nice trade agreement that saw the, an explosion of commercial activity between China and Japan. The close proximity of China and Japan has always been a great advantage to both sides. And from these days in the Song Dynasty all the way up till today, China-Japan trade has been a long thread in the fabric that makes up China-Japan relations. But like I said, when Ashikaga Yoshimochi takes over in 1395, that's it. The shutters come down, the doors close, and all official trade and cultural relations cease. And then with the last shogunate, the Tokugawa, Japan shuts up like a clam, and I guess that's a good thing and that there was no major trouble between China and Japan. So if you all remember the pain and suffering in China caused by all these infamous Japanese war ko, or pirates, this is sort of where it all starts. With official trade relations cut off by Ashikaga Yoshimochi, all that's left is piracy and smuggling, or both. What follows is a long period where these wako, as they were called in Japanese, terrorized the coastal areas of Zhejiang, Fujian, and Liaoning. This was a serious problem. And just as President Thomas Jefferson did in 1801 with the Barbary pirates, so did the Hongwu Emperor when he put his foot down and said enough is enough and he tried to stand up to these wako. And this, of course, didn't end the sustained misery caused by these Japanese pirates. It took a long time to wipe them out. These Somali pirates of today could have learned a thing or two from the wako. If you ask me... I have never in 30 years heard even one Chinese friend or colleague mention anything about, you know, the darn Japanese Wako pirates. Rarely is the subject of what happened during the Yuan Dynasty, during Kublai Khan's two attempted invasions. It's, that's never mentioned. At the end of the day, I don't think all of this, I don't know, what do you want to call it, the great game that China and Japan played in Korea to obtain dominance with, you know, that perfect geographic buffer the peninsula offered. Not too many harsh words are spoken about those days. Eastern Han to the early Qing. This was the period where Japan's very unique culture and society sort of hooked an IV line in China. And for centuries, on and off, depending on how locked down Japan was at the time, they took all that great stuff from the Han, all that technological know-how, that great Chinese writing system that they adopted and adapted as their kanji, and everything that had been accumulated up till that time as well. All the philosophy that flourished during the Zhou dynasty, they got a hold of that too. Confucianism. I mean, these were not small things. And then in between the 7th and 11th centuries when China exploded onto the world and became the wonder of all civilizations who sent representatives to Chang'an and Luoyang and the cities that you know sprung up along the Grand Canal and the Yangtze. The Japanese, next-door neighbors, they got to sift through all the good treasures that made up Chinese culture, military science, technology, and anything that was a good fit with the Japanese way of life, they got that too. When you think about that notion that Japan borrowed heavily from China, this was that period. Of course, it wasn't a one-way street. I don't subscribe to the 
popular belief that all these exchanges between China and Japan from the Han to the Ming Dynasty was a one-sided affair. I'm sure when two great minds meet, there's a lot of energy and ideas that bring value to both sides. Yeah, no one ever complains about those days too much. They're from so long ago. And besides, even though they were on again, off again, slugging it out in Korea, and you had Kublai Khan's two invasions, and pirates were causing endless grief to Chinese commerce and society along the coast, for the most part, relations were still okay. With hardly an exception, whenever they got together, both Japan and China remained steadfast in their own belief that they themselves was the other's superior in every way, and created this whole system whereby they could get along, and though they didn't seem to trust each other and had that competition in them, they had that Buddhist bond and that admiration of similar values, and that went a long way. Yeah, this part of Chinese-Japanese history, in today's world that we live in, in the year 2011, this whole period of their history doesn't really cause any negative feelings that are still fresh in the mind of many Chinese when Zhao Qijeng spoke about that 70% of Chinese who felt negatively about Japan, I don't think it was these things that they were talking about. And in our 21st century world, it's always spectacular news when there's a big brouhaha like the one last year about this time when a Chinese fishing boat had a run-in with the Japanese Coast Guard in the uh, Diaoyutai Islands, the Senkakus. This chain of islands has been under dispute for a long time, but it wasn't a, really a big deal until the 1870s. And that, after all this rambling about the backstory, is where our episode today begins. All the hard feelings that exist today mainly come out of the half century from 1895 to 1945. If not for the history of these 50 years, who knows how the arc of history for China and Japan would have curved. If you've listened to enough of these China history podcasts, especially starting with the uh, Qing Dynasty series, we all know the story about how the Industrial Revolution changed the world and how the Western powers became the first ones to use the destructive forces of these new technologies and how they all used this head start and figuring this whole thing out. And they went into Asia and, well, we all know what happened. China received their rude awakening in the 1840s, during the time of the Daoguang Emperor. No Twitter back then, but word traveled to Japan about these guys who smelled bad and had these weapons, the likes of which were indefensible. And when Commodore Perry shows up in 1852, Meiji Japan takes that risky step into the vast unknown and just as Japan had done with China for centuries, now they turned their sights to the Westerners and spent a lot of effort doing that thing they do and everything, no matter how big or small. If it was a good fit with Japan, they adopted it and they made it theirs. And they got very smart, very fast, and very big and very powerful. As fate would have it, right at this point in history, when all the weapons of war had this huge spike in mass destructive and killing power, you had a very aggressive militaristic class in Japan, the descendants of the samurai and the shoguns. So that was not a good thing, but that's the way history is. These 19th and 20th century neocons and their great ideas are mostly to blame for the damage done during these 50 years. So this is really where it all starts, I guess. Japan got this Massive head start. China, of course, much to the nation's regret later on, was caught flat-footed. Since the days of Sima Qian, when he started writing everything down all the way up to the 19th century, China had always been self-assured that even though there you know, were times when things weren't so good and the country wasn't unified, but still, China was the place. This was the place everyone wanted to trade with. This was the place that had, you know, the amazing architecture and culture and people and all the cool stuff. So after all these centuries, how can we say, a sense of entitlement to sort of rest on past laurels may have infected the thinking of key decision makers in Beijing at that critical time in the early 1800s when some 
Chinese saw something was up and they better get with it. So Japan soon found itself in a position to flex its muscles. And this really is where all the animosity and aggressive feelings today have their roots. Since we've covered all these events previously in earlier podcasts, let's just name the major incidents that collectively form what is known as the Japanese militaristic invasion against China. 1894-1895, the Sino-Japanese War. Once again, all started in Korea with Japan and China supporting their particular factions. One thing led to another, and from this spark, the whole Sino-Japanese War was ignited, and with that, the resulting Treaty of Shimonoseki, or the Maguan Tiaoyue. The terms were extremely oppressive and humiliating to China on multiple levels. This was particularly offensive in light of Chinese attitudes about Japan and Japanese. Maybe if it had ended there, who knows? I think relations could have easily bounced back from this chapter in history. So the Japanese, they got Taiwan. That was a big one. The Chinese never forgot that part of the treaty. And after the Sino-Japanese War, and when the Japanese started making themselves at home in parts of Manchuria, word began to spread real fast about how brutal these guys were. All the beheadings, and of course with the well-earned reputation for stories of brutality with which Japanese treated their prisoners and the populace wherever they went. This spread fast, and it was a like I said, it was a well-earned reputation. But of course, we all know it gets worse, and in quick succession, you have the Boxer Rebellion with Japan on the side of the Westerners, so they got to also extract their dutiful pound of flesh from China. Then World War I, Japan moves in and grabs Qingdao all for themselves. That's followed by the 21 Demands in 1915. And then we know it's right around this time that China starts to get its act together, and, well, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. So during this period where China is laying low and getting up off its knees, Japan is having a gay old time building their interests, mostly in Manchuria, but elsewhere as well. They're winning few friends, as local Chinese resent having them there, of course. Who wouldn't? And there was a general feeling among the populace, that they were getting the short end of the stick in any dealings with the Japanese. And of course, Japan was able to back up many of their more aggressive demands with military muscle. So although there weren't any major flare-ups, as Japan penetrated deeper and deeper into China and concentrated themselves in certain cities and sort of made it clear they were getting themselves set in for the long haul, by the looks of it, from any angle, in the 1920s and 30s, Japan was fixing to stay a while, as we say in American. 1928 comes the next big incident in order to smash and grab all of Manchuria for themselves. Japanese agents blow up the train carrying the warlord Zhang Zolin. The old guy simply couldn't see things their way, the way the Japanese liked it, so they had him done in. Three years later, Japan has everything they want, and Manchuria is their own little puppet state known as Manchukuo, or in Chinese, Manchukuo. And then it was on September 18, 1931, the Mukden Incident, Zhou Yipa Shipian. It goes by many other names as well. Mukden is today uh, known as the city of Shenyang. This was the staged incident in history that Japan used as a pretext to move in and take everything in Manchuria as their very own. And this was a huge embarrassment to Chiang Kai-shek and his government as they were excoriated, even to this day, for the way they handled it and just sort of backed down without a fight. July 7th, Ringo Starr's birthday, but in 1937, we have the Marco Polo Bridge incident, the Chi Chi Shi Bien, which most people call the official start of the Second Sino-Japanese War. A month later, August 13, 1937, war breaks out in Shanghai between the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese. And then four months later in Nanjing, December 13, 1937, we have the Nanjing Massacre. Those five months, August, September, October, November, December, 1937, 
a much better supplied and much more militarily savvy Japanese war machine just went on the rampage in China and wherever they went, they made no friends. No friendship missions during this time or Buddhist educational exchanges. Some in Japan were happy with their spoils gained in Manchuria. I think they might have stopped there. So rich was that vast land to the Northeast in all manners of natural resources. And it was like an, it, it was an entire country-sized market in Manchuria to buy Japanese goods. But Chiang Kai-shek, he took the fight to Shanghai, and the Japanese took the fight right to him, and wherever they went, it wasn't pretty. And it all sort of culminated on December 13th, 1937. Next year will be the 75-year anniversary of this historical event. I'm not going to get into the details here. We'll just, we'll look at the Nanjing Massacre and the life of John Rabe in a later podcast. Let's just say for the purposes of today's topic, the Nanjing Massacre was just another brick in the wall as far as a chapter from Chinese history that particularly influences modern attitudes about Japan and China, even amongst the younger generations of today. And then, from there on out, from 37 all the way up to the defeat of Japan in 1945, Japan and China, they slugged it out in the countryside, in the cities, everywhere. The stories of bravery and human endurance during this period are told and retold in China. And over time, the Chinese wore the Japanese down, and by August of 1945, it was official, and it was curtains for Japan. Now the shoe was on the other foot. Or was it? If all this wasn't enough to drive a deep wedge between any future friendship and cooperation between China and Japan, words started to get out about all the various atrocities that Japan carried out during the course of the war. The signature atrocity was, of course, the medical experiments carried out on Chinese nationals by the infamous Unit 731, as well as the use of chemical and bacteriological weapons. Unit 731, located up in Harbin, has been a, an especially hard one to forgive for various reasons. We all don't have to think too hard to come up with any. So, what are we talking here? 1895 to 1945. These... 50 years, all this bad blood, Treaty of Shimonoseki, land grabbing in Manchuria, Qingdao in 1917, the 21 demands, the humiliation of Manjukuo and what it stood for, the Mukden incident 1931, Marco Polo Bridge incident 1937, the Nanjing massacre, and all the brutality, killing, and misery caused by Japanese forces during the war, all the way up to Japan's defeat in 1945. If all this wasn't bad enough, in the aftermath of World War II, Japan rose up like a phoenix. And well, we all know what Japan came. And to make matters worse, Japan became America's best friend in Asia along the way. And this presented a whole other universe of geopolitical complications. Even after all the horrific things the Japanese soldiers did to my fellow Americans during World War II, they became our BFFs and are still today. I mean, even though we thought they were going to eat us up alive in the 1980s, and the way we got so close to Japan and acted as their laotaka, their big brother, this didn't do anything to help their situation with China. And just like the far right in the U.S., you know, somehow gets away with all kinds of outrageous behavior, and the more outrageous, the more attention it gets. Same in Japan. These right-wing extremists, a small but vociferous minority, continue to openly glorify the you know, annual homage to the Yasukuni Shrine that the Prime Minister is stuck going to, even though he knows everyone is going to get pissed off in China. And then you have the matter of textbooks, that sort of, you know, textbooks in Japan, that sort of gloss over those 50 years like, you know, ain't no thing, you know, that's how it is with war. So this predictably, you know, infuriates Chinese. Taiwan also, another hot button issue with Sino-Japanese relations. Why? Well, after World War II, Japan had to give back Taiwan and the Penghu Islands, also known as the Pescadores, 
Japan and the U.S. were in a lockstep with their support of the nationalists who had fled to Taiwan in 1949. They've sort of worked it out for the most part, but anytime anything happens at an official level, there's you know the usual outrage coming out of Beijing. In 2001, you may recall, there was a big ruckus made when former President Li Donghui went to Japan for medical treatment. I mean, this whole matter is a very sensitive issue. The Diaoyu Tai Islands, of which uh, Diaoyu Island is the grandest of them all at a whopping size of 4.3 square kilometers. Well, both Japan and China claim them as their own, and for the time being, they try to avoid any major confrontations. But every now and then, like there was a year ago, you get these crazies on both sides who try and create an incident which just ruptures this whole sore and, you know, there will be a general outpouring of nationalism on both sides. Never pretty. No final resolution on this matter as things stand today. And there's the whole matter of Japan and the U.S. In short, China doesn't like this. Chinese people don't like it either. But After 1945, the whole issue of Japanese-American security cooperation has added sort of insult to injury to the matter of Sino-Japanese relations. And to this day, it's, you know, it's definitely still an irritant. So America has sort of been dragged into this leftover problem from history. And speaking of irritants, like in almost all wars, they're not necessarily over when they're over. When the last Japanese troops left China after all was lost, the Japanese military machine, they they left behind no small amount of chemical weapons or what we refer to today as weapons of mass destruction. These were buried or destroyed. And this, this whole mess of these leftover chemical weapons was addressed finally 54 years after the fact when on July 30th, 1999, a memorandum was signed by both nations to address this leftover issue. So here we are in 2011. The relationship between China and Japan has survived quite well. The historical problems that plagued the relationship throughout the entirety of the 20th century and into the 21st century have been addressed and will continue to be addressed until all sides can come to a sort of amicable agreement. You have all the Lao Bai Xing of both China and Japan involved in the decision-making process. Everyone has an opinion about how this history played out and what the hokuo, or the consequences, should be. And as I have said from time to time in various podcasts, a lot of news coming out of China today is colored by China's recent and ancient history. The issue of China and Japan's relationship in the world today is a perfect example where knowledge of the past history helps to shed some light on today's attitudes and why governments react the way they do and why common people say the things they say. Time is always the great equalizer. All the events in China, all the dynasties, the great and the weak emperors, the warring kingdoms during the periods of disunity, all the heroes, the villains, the great national achievements and the humiliations, the invasions from people of the steppes and, you know, the foreign imperialist powers, everything over time gets equalized. Every great civilization on the planet, no matter China, Japan, France, England, Russia, Zimbabwe, all have their moments of glory and moments of defeat on the world stage. The half century of events that we discussed in today's episode are still fresh in the minds of many. This is mainly because this is still recent history. I think the Chinese people have forgiven the Mongols for the brutality of their mid-13th century invasions and for the strong arm with which they once ruled China. I'm certain that in time, in the context of perhaps many positive things that will grow the relationship as history unfolds, the Chinese people will forgive the Japanese as well. I just hope the world doesn't need to wait 700 years or anything close to that number. Zhao Qi Zheng, in his People's Daily piece, closed by saying this, and I'll just quote him, Correctly understanding and handling China-Japan relations is an historic burden of the people and politicians of the two countries. 
Treating and handling the issues strategically means considering and handling the issues in a historical, overall, and future view. It is the only correct way. China-Japan relations should be subject to and serve the overall global situation of peace and development, jointly promoting the peace and development of Northeast Asia, Asia, and even the world should be a common historic responsibility of the two countries. And so, since this is the China history podcast and not the Japan history podcast, I've explained the history from a Chinese point of view. There's also a Japan point of view, and things that could be said in mitigation, but whatever happened indeed happened, and it's all history now, and history should be studied so that everyone can learn from the past. So that's it for today. We went a little bit longer than usual, but considering the seriousness and significance of this topic, I hope no one will hold me in too much contempt. This is Laszlo Montgomery, once again signing off from the college town of Claremont, California, 91711. Join us next week, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.